Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. My message for today is about cruciform discipleship. Cruciform, of course, meaning the cross. And uh, if you remember back to the days of the Brady Bunch, remember that show on TV? And there was a line that was often said, or a line that's been repeated a lot, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Well, here we might say, Peter, Peter, Peter. As you know, Peter gets it right. In last week, we talked about uh, Christ taking his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi. It was a place which was considered pagan central. That was where the Greeks celebrate the god Pan. And before the Greeks, uh, Canaanites used to have cultic worship there because uh, a major stream there originated that fed the Jordan River. And it came through a cave, and it had a waterfall and a beautiful little pond, and then it formed a stream. And people thought that was really unique. It was mystical but it was a site of pagan worship. And that's where Christ, as you recall, asked his disciples, who do they say that I am? And of course, some said, you know, some say you're a John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah. And then Peter pipes up and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we say, what a confession. Peter got it right. And then as Peter maybe is looking around at the disciples, wondering if he's going to get some accolades from Christ, Jesus says, by the way, Peter, that great confession, blessed are you, but that didn't actually come from you. That came from my, ma my Father who revealed it to you. And so we're going to talk a little bit about faith today and what it means to live a life of cruciform discipleship. Let's begin. Christ, though, has heard this great confession from Peter, and then he begins, it says in the Gospel of Matthew, to take his disciples down a little different path of what is going to happen to him. He says, I'm going to be going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be suffering under the Pharisees and the scribes and the rulers of the day. And I will be crucified and I will rise after three days. And of course, Peter's listening in. He just already, remember, said this great confession. And now he says, Lord, I, I want to talk to you. And he, rebu he rebukes Christ. Usually that probably isn't a good thing, right? To rebuke God. But he rebukes Christ. And he says, Far be it from you, Lord. And of course, this should not happen. And Christ says, Get behind me, Satan. And boy, that sounds like rough words coming from our Lord, doesn't it? I mean, that's, you know, Peter meant it out of great love. He was trying to protect his Lord from any suffering, from any humility, and certainly from dying. And he maybe missed the part about he was going to be raised from the dead. But Satan is called out. He says, get behind me, Satan. Great accolades, Peter, for saying the confession that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and now he's called, basically, Diabolo, Satan. Satan has that unique trait here of really slightly twisting what sounds like a statement of love into actually a very diabolical statement to try to interfere with, really, the will of God the Father and the will of that the Son is obedient to the Father to die on the cross and be raised. So Christ calls it as it is. That is a satanic move. And it happens to us in our lives. It happens to us in our church. If you look at the various denominations that we have that are called Christian denominations, look at the subtle twists that sometimes occur in how we interpret Scripture to try to bend it to where culture is at. That's the work, usually, of Satan influencing us. Just a minor little twist just like he did with Adam and Eve. So Peter, Peter's now, I'm sure, rather taken back, but boy, did he ever get a good lesson here in faith and what faith means. And I'd like to share with you uh, some insights from Reverend Dr. Martin Franzen. He wrote a book about Matthew on Follow Me, Discipleship According to Matthew. And when he talks about faith, what I like is he says, first of all, faith is receiving. And Christ pointed that out to Peter when he said to him that when Peter made that great confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that did not come from men. They did not reveal that to you. That came directly from God. God, as you know, implants faith in us. It's not anything we can do. I did not, by my own reason or strength, come to know God or believe in him by the work of the Holy Spirit, as Martin Luther articulated. So faith is really a receiving element that is receiving God's grace. And when we confess it, we're confessing what God has actually implanted in us, as he told Peter. And then, faith is relatedness, um, Dr. Franzman says. And what he means by that is it always relates to an object. Faith is trust, as you know. 
And it's putting trust in a higher being. Now, when Peter said the words that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, he is relating his confession to divinity. He's actually naming Christ as the anointed one, the king over all creation, who is to be the ruler of all and is God. So faith always relates to something external from us. And then finally, faith is commitment. As you know, these words really come out when he says to Peter, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Because what Peter was doing when he was trying to protect Jesus from any suffering is he was really being self-focused. I like being with you, Jesus. I sort of like this gig we have going. You know, maybe he was reflecting on the many miracles he even did as a result of Christ empowering he and his disciples. Maybe the fact that he felt like he was becoming sort of the leader of the group. After all, Christ called him the rock, and on this rock I will build my church, meaning on his confession. But he wasn't denying himself when he became actually inadvertently selfish by wanting to protect his Savior from any suffering, from any pain, from death, and then, of course, from the resurrection that's meant for all. Luther uh, wrote this beautiful Heidelberg Disputation in which he talked about what it means to be a theologian of the cross. And that's contrasted to something called being a theologian of glory. Now, when you hear that word, being a theologian of glory, it seems like, man, I want to be a theologian of glory. That sounds right. But what Luther meant by that is, is being a theologian or someone who actually looks at self as being maybe more important or actually forming this Jesus who we all say Jesus saves, but taking that Jesus and trying to milk him, make him more like we want him to be our Jesus. We want him maybe not to suffer quite as much. We'd like him to be more like a king. That's what the Jews wanted, right? A real king. And that's being a theologian of glory. It's really a focus on self versus a focus on God and others. So a theologian of cross is sort of denying self, which is really tough. And if you find it hard to deny yourself, well, you're in the same boat with probably all of us. We're all in there together. It's very hard to deny self because we have our own sinful flesh that sort of weighs on what's important to us, how we like to see things, and it might be how we view sanctity of life because we sort of think this is the right way to interpret it, and yet God tells us how it really should be interpreted. Don't let Satan twist what God's Word tells us. Maybe it's about marriage, and you think, you know, uh, I don't know that it's so bad. I mean, let's, I, I, I don't mind so much same-sex civil unions, even though it goes against God's words. I'm not saying you're there, but many are there. And that's a degree of not denying self and allowing self to be influenced by the culture. So Luther says we have to deny everything that's in our being when we have faith, because faith is given to us out of grace. Faith has a relatedness to the divine heavenly trinity, and faith also has a commitment, and that commitment is to deny one's self. Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it this way, when Christ calls, and he was a German theologian, as you may recall, that was involved in an assassination plot against Hitler in World War II. He was in New York, um, as some of you may know, and he was a pastor there. He went over to Germany to directly intervene as best he could in World War II. And anyway, Dietrich said, when a Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. And he means die to self. And this dying to self is really picking up your cross and following Jesus. It's dying so that you live. So we might put it this as come and die so that you may come and live. Live a new life, a new focus in Christ. Easy to say, hard to do. So what's the now what? Well, first we have to take a step. We have to take a step that's in a direction away from us. It requires a recentering on Christ, of course. And the denial of self means as we look around of all the needs that we want to have self-satisfied to keep our happiness quotient at a high level, it says put a check on it, put a balance on it. It doesn't mean that you can't be happy in life. It doesn't mean that you can't look for things to fulfill you. It doesn't mean any of that, but it means that your primary focus has to be not on you, but on others. First on God and then love your neighbor as yourself. Jeremiah, in our reading for today in the Old Testament, you know, he was sort of talking about this when his calling heard. He said, Lord, I'm getting hammered. I'm not enjoying life here telling everybody in Israel bad news on a constant basis and getting beat up. And what does God tell him? Not to worry. I'm there for you. 
Your persecutors will never overtake you. Satan will not be able to overtake you because I am with you. And that's the word that the Lord tells us very directly. Lo, I'm with you always until the end of the age. Romans, Paul puts it beautifully here. He says, be joyful in hope. Be patient in affliction when life isn't going so well. That's when Satan tends to rear his ugly head. I think Satan was involved maybe in our water main and maybe the gas leak, a few other things, possibly. You know, to delay church, to cancel church, but it says be joyful in hope, be patient in affliction, and be faithful in prayer. Joyful, patient, faithful is the call of cruciform discipleship. And then Paul ends it, I think, quite beautifully when he says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And that means we have to live a life of reconciliation, where when we are wronged by our neighbor, by our friend, by our loved one, by our enemy, we forgive, we reconcile, and we move forward for the sake of peace. That's cruciform discipleship. And what we are asked to do is that last word, excuse me, it's commit, if you can see it on the cross. We are to commit to a new life in Christ. And I want to end here with just a little excerpt that comes from uh, The Genius of Luther's Theology by Robert Kolb and Charles Aaron. They say, no one can believe apart from the Holy Spirit. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 and 12, 3. From the standpoint of the human observer, that trust from the creature fashioned in God's image is nothing but a product of the functioning of mind and will of thinking and feeling. We are brought to faith when we experience the Holy Spirit working in us who moves mind and will in his recreative act. It happens to us when faith is put in us. It happens again during our baptism as he puts the mind of Christ in us. The Holy Spirit is using the believer's witness our speaking the words of the gospel as Peter so conveyed. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, as his instrument for his sovereign act of recreating new human creatures out of chaos and the nothingness of our sinful lives to deny ourselves and follow Christ. Faith saves because faith is the restoration on the human side of the trust that provides the fundamental orientation of all of life. Faith saves because it places human beings in their proper place, in God's embrace, in the hands of the Savior with holes through his palms, the one whom believers know will never let them go. Luther noted on Hebrews 11, faith holds on and refuses to doubt simply because it cannot see anything but the cross and the resurrection. Faith has trust. It's constant reinforcement. So today, please die to yourself to live for God and for our fellow man. In Jesus' name, amen.